Thanks for tuning in again this week, ladies and gentlemen, as we draw aside from our regular routine to consider the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greatest person ever born, and his is the greatest story ever told. Today we are going to look at Jesus' passion primarily in the book of John. John called himself the disciple that Jesus loved, not, in my opinion, because Jesus loved him any more than he loved the others, but because John was so in tune with Jesus that he perceived it at a deeper level. After all, the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. He loves us all the same. Today, we will see the tenderness of John's gospel and the obvious affection between him and the Lord. Stay tuned. It's the 21st century, the end of man's dominion of planet Earth. What time is it on God's time clock? The paradigm is changing. It's time for the judgment of the nations. It's time for the return of the Lord. It's time for Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia. Teresa teaches end time truths line upon line from the Word of God. As the Church of Jesus Christ prepares for our finest hour, join Teresa in studying and understanding the end of the age. I'm Teresa Garcia. Thanks for joining me again today as we discuss the bittersweet story of the passion, death, and resurrection of the Savior of the world. I want to wish you all a very holy, happy, joy-filled Resurrection Sunday. Heavenly Father, our goal today is to study the passion of your Son so that we might understand it better and appreciate it more. It grace us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin with a rhetorical question based on Amos 3, verse 7. Did the apostles know before the fact that Jesus was going to suffer and die? Remember what it says in Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. The answer to our question is in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell us that they were told by Jesus that he would suffer and die. Let's look at the first time in Matthew 16. They are at this time at Caesarea Philippi. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And by the way, shortly after this, Peter, James, and John also got to go with him on the Mount of Transfiguration where he talked with Elijah and Moses. What did they discuss? His departure, which was soon to take place at Jerusalem. Now, every time Jesus brought the subject up again, he would give them a little more information than they had the time before. And so the next time he tells them again, he also gives them this, that he is going to be betrayed. This is when they are in Galilee. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. The third time he tells him, them they are on their way to Jerusalem, and uh, let's listen to this then in the Gospel of Luke. He then took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be delivered to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and insulted, and spit upon. They will scourge him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. So they knew, but they didn't understand 
Luke tells us that in the next verse. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. Now, for the rest of today's show, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. And so we will not be discussing the fact that Jesus uh, sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, nor the fact that he asked his father to let this chalice pass from him if it were at all possible. We're picking it up in John chapter 13 at the Last Supper. At this point, Jesus reveals that it is one of them who will betray him. Uh, John asks him who it is. Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. At this point, after Judas leaves, Jesus begins teaching in detail for the first time God's plan for the church. And uh, he tells them that he is going to send them, or the Father will send them, another helper. He stresses the indwelling of the Father and the Son. He tells them, my Father loves you, keep my commandments, I love you, and I will be with you, I will manifest myself to you. And he also tells them that the world will hate them. Really, John chapters 14 through 17 are some of the most beautiful words in the whole Bible. Jesus concludes in John 17 with these words, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Or as Paul would say a generation later in the book of Colossians, Christ in you, your hope of glory. Now, when he went with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered, and Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So when they come, Jesus says to them, Whom are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. My Bible says that Jesus said, I am he, but actually he said, I am. If you notice, the he is in italics, which means that it was added at the privilege of the translator. What does Jesus mean when he says, I am? Let's go back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And Moses and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And so when Jesus identifies himself as I am uh, to the officers and the troops of the Pharisees, then it was a direct reference to the fact that he is God. What happened? They all fell down under the power of God. Let's listen to Rick Renner in his book, Paid in Full. He says this, 
there was so much power present that they fell down and no one could have withstood Jesus if he had chosen to resist. Jesus was not taken by the will of man, but he was delivered by the will of the Father. Once Jesus demonstrated that he could not be taken by force, he then allowed the soldiers to seize him. In other words, he willingly uh, went with them. Continuing. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. But then Peter strikes Malchus and removes his ear. It's not time for Peter to be martyred. And so Jesus heals his ear and we hear no more about it. Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now, why did they take him to Annas? Rick Renner tells us why. He says, Annas was a great political operative in those days. He actually controlled uh, many things politically and served as the high priest for nine years. Finally, the uh, Romans said, okay, you can't be high priest anymore. He was getting so powerful. He was so wealthy. And so then uh, Annas gave the job to his son-in-law, Caiaphas, so he could retain his power. All right, so here is uh, his encounter with Annas. The high priest Annas then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. At this point, the high priest's assistant slaps Jesus on the face, Jesus challenged him on this. Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So in my thinking, Annas knew that his servant had crossed the line. He didn't want any more of this. So he sent Jesus to his son-in-law. Now, Jesus actually endured a total of six illegal trials. Let's listen to what they are. The first one we just discussed, trial before Annas, Caiaphas' father-in-law. The second trial before Caiaphas, Caiaphas asked Jesus if he were the son of God. Jesus answered yes, and Caiaphas tore his own clothes. The third one, a trial before the Sanhedrin, after the chief priests consulted with the elder scribes and whole council, they sent Jesus to Pilate. His first trial before Pilate, Pilate found no fault in Jesus and sent him to Herod. The trial before Herod, Jesus declined to speak to Herod, possibly because Herod had martyred his cousin John. Second trial before Pilate, Pilate again found no reason to crucify Jesus. All right, let's pick up the action now at the sixth trial. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands, and Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know I find no fault in him. Now before Pilate, Jesus comes out to get sentenced, let's go back to Zechariah and look at a famous prophecy. In this prophecy, uh, the Lord tells Zechariah to crown the high priest as king. 
In the Old Testament, the high priest was never the king. So this is a prophecy about Jesus. Let's listen to David Barron. In Zechariah, this is one of the most remarkable and precious messianic prophecies. There is no plainer prophetic utterance in the whole Old Testament as to the person of the promised Redeemer. Here is the prophecy. Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule on his throne. Let's listen again to David Barron. He says this, Behold the man, an expression which has become famous and of profound significance since some five centuries later, in the overruling providence of God, it was used by Pilate on the day when he who came to bring life into the world was himself led forth to a death of shame. So now let's hear as Pilate says those famous words, Behold the man. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. There are many paintings throughout the ages titled Eka Homo or Latin for Behold the Man. The forlorn lady looking down at the right side of your screen is presumably Pilate's wife who was opposed to crucifying the Lord. Then the chief priests and the officers who would have been familiar with the words Behold the Man in Zechariah were in a frenzy whipping up the crowd and getting them to cry, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate found no wrong in him, but he agreed. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away, and he, bearing the cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And so then the soldiers cast lot for Jesus' clothes. Jesus gave his mother Mary into the hands of John the Apostle. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Next, we will discuss one of the unsung heroes of the crucifixion, Joseph of Arimathea. And so he is actually written up in all four Gospels, and we can assume, I believe, by the narrative that he and Nicodemus had had some discussions. They both believed Jesus was Lord, and uh, Joseph uh, and Nicodemus obviously talked together that day. Let's listen to what the Word says about Joseph of Arimathea in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew says he was a rich man, the tomb where they laid Jesus belonged to him. Mark says he was a prominent council member who was waiting for the kingdom of God. Luke says he was a just man who had not consented to the decision to kill Jesus and that he was from Arimathea, which is a city in Judea. So now let's listen to what it says about him in the Gospel of John. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, 
bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Let's take a look. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in stripes, strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Now we will hear a poem about Joseph of Arimathea. There is a man named Joseph that I would like to meet, a very special Joseph that I do long to greet. One very famous Joseph, into slavery he was sold, reunited decades later when Jacob was so old, then Mary's husband, Joseph, helped to rear the perfect child, a carpenter of Nazareth, so strong yet meek and mild. But when I get to heaven at that banquet, take my seat, there is another Joseph that I will surely meet. He asked Pilate for the body. By asking, he risked all. He knew he had to do it to fulfill his holy call. He took that ravished body from the cross and lay it down, swaddled it with linen, and removed that wicked crown. Did Nicodemus help him take that body to the tomb? Did he watch while Mary kissed the firstborn from her womb? Before he rolled the stone in place, did he kneel and say goodbye? When he walked away that night, did he curse or did he cry? When I meet that Joseph, this is what I plan to say. Did you know that he would rise in triumph that third day? Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. So here we see early Sunday, mo Sunday morning before the sun is shining, or maybe they just barely see the sun. They are on their way to the tomb. Mary Magdalene comes and tells them. They run toward the tomb. John outruns Peter. He's younger, he's faster, and when he gets there, he does not go in because he knows that Jesus has nominated Peter as the head of the apostles, and so he's humble enough to wait there for his leader. Verse 3, Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. Now Simon Peter came following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. Next, John enters the tomb, and this next verse is so powerful to me. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. I personally have been in the garden tomb. I know many of you have too if you've been to Israel. We don't know if it's exactly where they laid Jesus, but we know what size slab it was. And I have a mental picture then of John standing there looking, and then all of a sudden he processes all of this in his mind, and he believes. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. We will be right back. In Leviticus 23, the Lord gave Moses the holy days that will play out as history unfolds. We are now living in those exciting times when the fall feasts will be fulfilled. The seven feasts of Israel foretell the history of the redemption of the world. Teresa's seven-part DVD series, The Moedim of Jehovah, answers the following questions. Should our day of rest be Saturday or Sunday? Is the rapture in the fall of the year? 
Why is the bread on Pentecost leavened? And when will Messiah return? Send $36 for Teresa's seven-part series, The Moedim of Jehovah. Also in the series, Teresa makes the case that Jesus was probably born in the fall of the year. She discusses Hanukkah and the Jewish hero Judah Maccabee, who defeated Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a type of the Antichrist. Order the Moedim of Jehovah right now for only $36. Call 618-281-3291 or send $36 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236. Or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. Call now and we'll include free with your order Teresa's teaching on the book of Esther and the ten sons of Haman, who are the type for the ten kings who rule with the Antichrist. Remember, call 618-281-3291 and ask for the Moedim of Jehovah for only $36 and we'll also send you absolutely free the teaching on the book of Esther. You may now order Teresa's 12-part Bible study on the book of Daniel, entitled Daniel in the Light of Revelation. This includes the 12-part DVD series and a teaching outline for each chapter, a 12-question test for each chapter, plus the answer key. Also copies of the charts, graphs, and prophecies used on the screen. This Bible study is not copyrighted and may be reproduced for your church, Bible school, cell group, or other use. In Daniel 12.4, he was told to seal the book until the time of the end. It is now the time of the end, and we've been given valuable information by Daniel about what is going to happen. To order the Bible study, Daniel, in the light of Revelation, send $39 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291 with your Visa or MasterCard, or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. You may also purchase Teresa's book on the end times from the hidden final edition at $4 off the regular price when you order Daniel in the light of Revelation. To include this book in your order, send $51 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236. Or call 618-281-3291. Or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. And thank you for including your tax-deductible donation when you order. Next week, we're going to begin a brand new series entitled, One Thing Will Save America. In the year 2008, the Lord gave Dr. Billy Brim a word on how America will be saved. Be sure to join me then. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we will see you next week. Thank you for watching Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia. You may contact us at Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236. Or call 618-281-3291. Or visit us online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. You may also find us on Facebook and Roku at Teresa Garcia Ministry. For prayer requests, call 618-281-3291 or mail them to us at Teresa Garcia, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236. Be sure to join us again next week for Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia.